Good evening. Welcome to the Graduate Center at the City University of New York. My name is Janet Gornick, and I'm Professor of Political Science and Sociology here at the Graduate Center, and I'm the director of the Stone Center on Socioeconomic Inequality. The Stone Center is a research center here focused on the study of income and wealth disparities, and among our many activities is housing the United States Office of LIS, the cross-national data archive that's located in Luxembourg. The Stone Center is co-sponsoring this evening's event, and in my role as director, I have the pleasure of welcoming all of you, and to those of you watching the live stream, uh, thanks for joining us. Okay, as you all know, we're convened this evening for a conversation about a new book titled After Piketty, The Agenda for Economics and Inequality. In this volume, the authors of 22 essays reflect on the enormously influential book by Thomas Piketty, Capital in the 21st Century, which was published, as most of you know, I'm sure, in 2013 by Harvard University Press. And tonight we have on stage four of the authors in the new volume, uh, Paul Krugman, Branko Milanovic, Salvatore Morelli, and Heather Boucher, and Heather also served as one of the editors of the volume. And starting in just a few minutes, the four of them are gonna present and assess highlights uh, from the new collection. Let me just mention, in case you note this, that we were expecting uh, Suresh Naidu this evening, Assistant Professor of Economics at Columbia, but he had to withdraw uh, due to the impending arrival of a baby who seemed to decide to want to appear this afternoon or something, and we thought that was a reasonable excuse. Um, <clears throat> as luck would have it, Salvatore Morelli, another one of the authors, was in town, and at 4.30 p.m. he agreed to step in. So thank you, Salvatore. That's what you call a last minute save. Um, okay, so before I turn the stage over to them, which I'll do soon, I wanna take just a few minutes to tell you why my colleagues and I at the Graduate Center and at the Stone Center were especially delighted uh, when Heather asked us to co-host this evening. And then I wanna say a few words about the original book just to help lay some context, and finally I'll introduce the speakers in just a little bit more um, detail. Why assess economic inequality on a stage at the City University of New York? Perhaps the best reason is that CUNY, the country's largest urban public university, is itself a massive project aimed at reducing socioeconomic inequality and enabling intergenerational mobility. When our first college, the City College of New York, was founded in 1847, it was described as an experiment whose purpose was to educate the children of the whole people. And 170 years later, that mission is intact. Today, almost 40% of our undergraduates come from homes with incomes of less than 20,000 a year, and 42% are the first in their families to go to college. Here at CUNY, we took note earlier this year when a new study by Raj Chetty and his colleagues produced a statistic that they call the college's mobility rate. And that statistic combines a college's share of students from lower income families with its success at propelling them into the upper parts of the distribution. Chetty et al identified the 10 US colleges with the highest mobility rates, and five of them were CUNY colleges. For those of you who are local, you'll be happy to know that was City, Lehman, Baruch, John Jay, and City Tech. Yay for CUNY. Um, furthermore, the Graduate Center, I think you all know that's where you are now, CUNY's doctoral granting campus and uh, the home to the Stone Center has long been a venue uh, for this, has long been a venue for the study of inequality, not just our center, but many others as well. The Stone Center's work on inequality, which is heavily empirical and quantitative, is carried out via an array of courses, intensive workshops, international conferences, lecture series, and public events. In the last four years, we have on this stage and others in the building co-hosted nearly 20 public events, focusing on the relationship between inequality and economic growth, globalization, technological change, immigration, occupational trends, the care economy, climate change, and global health. Our overarching goal is to contribute to and to deepen this complicated national conversation about economic inequality that has received so much attention in the last half dozen years. And in fact, one of our first large events was hosting a public book launch for the very book that would eventually spark this evening's gathering. That was, in fact, capital in the 21st century. It's almost impossible to say anything about Thomas Piketty's book that hasn't been said uh, already and many times, but nevertheless, I do wanna make three points about the book, uh, again, to help um, put the sequel in a bit of context. First of all, by all accounts, by nearly all accounts, the book was an intellectual tour de force. It was innovative theoretically, it integrated economic and historical methods to build a novel framework for understanding the interplay between capital accumulation 
economic growth, and rising inequality. The book wasn't only descriptive and diagnostic, it was predictive, envisioning a second Gilded Age, another Belle Epoque, one in which, again, the claims of wealth, especially inherited wealth, would drive political developments and shape economic structures. Income and, moreover, wealth would rise uh, threatening, if not reversing, <clears throat> excuse me, an era of convergence and access to resources. Uh, finally, the book was also prescriptive. Piketty laid out a sweeping plan for transforming public finance on a global scale, a plan intended to push back on this rising inequality. Prominent economists, including some on our stage, uh, celebrated the book in high-profile reviews, calling it a watershed book in economic thinking, the most important economic book of the year, maybe of the decade, and declaring it written in the tradition of great economic texts. Even its critics, and there were several, admired its scope. Uh, second, and this may be of interest mainly to researchers, Piketty's book introduced its readers to the power of public tax records for studying inequality. Tax data are especially useful for assessing the richest households, the exact stratum that's difficult to study using the survey data that we at LIS, our institute, have worked with and produced for so many decades. As a result, the Piketty book and the distribution of the data on which it was based complemented and enlarged ongoing methodological practices used to study income and wealth inequality uh, with a sharp focus on the most affluent. Third, the book was insanely popular, with record-breaking sales topping more than two million copies, three million by some accounts, uh, translations into over 30 languages, countless public events, reviews and scores of academic and popular venues, and a film is in the works. I was often amused by seeing people reading it on the New York City subway, uh, and I noted that my eye doctor had it sitting on his instruments table. <laughs> I might add that he's a good eye doctor, but his, his grasp of the book was a little blurry. Um, so, um, in fact, the book was so popular that its popularity became the subject of study. Why this book and why at this moment in time the answer to that question might remain one of the publishing mysteries of all times. In After Piketty, Arthur Goldhammer <clears throat> excuse me, provides an intriguing analysis of what he calls the Piketty phenomenon. And as the translator of the original book, he had a front row seat during its wild ride. And yet in the end, even Goldhammer concludes that ultimately the book's popularity defies explanation. So now here we are, more than three years later, and it's time to assess the book and its impact on scholarship, on policy analysis, on economic practice, and with steely eyes. And that's exactly what our guest this evening uh, will do. Paul Krugman is Distinguished Professor of Economics here at the Graduate Center and also a core faculty member in the Stone Center and a List Senior Scholar. He's well known, of course, for his academic career, a long list of honors that he's received, including the Clark Medal and the Nobel and for his twice-weekly column uh, in the New York Times. In his contribution to After Piketty, Paul lays out the fundamental economic and political thesis of Piketty's book, detailing why it is that we're now in a new Gilded Age. Excuse me. Branko Milanovic, on the far left, is visiting presidential professor here at the Graduate Center, um, where he's also a core faculty member in the Stone Center and a list senior scholar. Branko's main area of work is income inequality, both within countries and globally, as well as in pre-industrial societies. In his contribution to After Piketty, Branco presents a model that explores the effects of the rising capital share on income inequality, and he concludes that a more equitable distribution of capital is the surest route to avoiding the unequal world that Piketty projects. Salvatore Morelli uh, earned his DPhil in economics from Oxford in 2013, and since then he has served as a research associate uh, at INET, the Institute for New Economic Thinking at the Oxford Martin School. Salvatore's interests center on the economics of income and wealth distribution, macroeconomic history, and applied microeconomics. This September, he'll begin a two-year position here at the Graduate Center, serving as a visiting fellow with the Advanced Research Collaborative and a senior researcher in the Stone Center, where he'll oversee a new project on high-end wealth. You can hear the theme here of the Stone Center. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, does, uh, Salvatore is going to ask in his contribution uh, to after Bichetti, excuse me, does, um, does inequality affect economic stability? If so, how? What do we know and what more do we need to know to advise policymakers on this question? And last but never least, Heather Boucher is Executive Director and Chief Economist at the Washington Center for Equitable Growth. 
Her research focuses on economic inequality and public policy, specifically employment, social policy, and family economic well-being. In her contribution, Heather looks at the institutions that matter for inheritance and explores the role that gender disparities play in this era of patrimonial capitalism. Please join me in welcoming this evening's speakers. Thank you. Oh, great. This is on. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, uh, thank you, Janet, and thank you to the Sohn Center for hosting this event this evening. We're so happy to be able to partner with you, especially since so many of our authors are here at the Stone Center. It seemed like an appropriate place to do our first book event for After Piketty. Um, I also want to note that there are two authors up here in the second row, Elora Delacourt and Elizabeth Jacobs, who are also here this evening. Um, and we've got many others who emailed because they were very disappointed that they couldn't make it to New York tonight. Um, among them, Art Goldhammer, the, who was Piketty's translator and who wrote the opening chapter, who was very dismayed that he could not make it here, among other people. Um, so I want to just uh, set the stage a little bit before we get into the conversation here and um, tell you a little about why we, why we wrote this book, why, we, why we're here tonight, how we got here. Um, I want to start by thanking Ian Malcolm, who was um, Thomas Piketty's editor at Harvard University Press and approached um, the Washington Center for Equitable Growth, Brad DeLong and myself, to help him put together this edited collection. He wanted to sort of get people thinking and working on the next steps post Piketty, and could we help him put together an edited collection? And this was something that Thomas himself was also very excited about and um, uh, eager to work with Ian and us on. So we're very grateful for their help um, and inspiration to, to put this book together. From the get-go, our goal, um, as Bob Solo writes in his contribution here, was to take capital in the 21st century seriously. And um, as we looked and as we started this project, Brad and I compiled all of the different reviews that we could find on Piketty. And um, it was over 700 pages of, you know, internet pages of different reviews. And we felt that there was, there was a lot of talk out there, but it didn't seem that the economics profession and economists were taking it, the, the core ideas as seriously as we wanted them to. We wanted more serious critique and um, engagement. So that was a big part of our motivation in the book. But we also um, were very thoughtful about the fact that we wanted this to be an interdisciplinary volume. And Thomas himself was very um, strongly, very much strongly encouraged us to bring in sociologists and um, geographers and some legal scholars, some people outside of economics. And as we wrote in the introduction um, uh, that I, I co-authored with Brad DeLong and Marshall Steinbaum, that it seemed that other disciplines were actually doing more to really engage deeply with the ideas of Piketty. And sort of one of the conclusions of our state of play and our hope that this conversation tonight with a bunch of economists and that this book will help spark more economics conversation. But we were excited to have this interdisciplinary engagement. Um, we were able to bring all of the authors, not all, most of them. There were 22 authors. I think we had 15 that we brought together for a conference. So there was a lot of three-day debate about all of this, which may explain why the book is so long. It's, in fact, only seven pages shy of the original, um, and which I'm, a, a fact that I'm actually not very proud of. I, I, I had not hoped that we would do that. Um, it feels very big, and I hope you all buy it on Kindle. Um, although maybe I shouldn't say that, because maybe Ian wants you all to buy it on hardback. But there you go. Um, so let me just, a couple more things um, about uh, how we as editors saw this challenge. You know, Janet did a nice introduction to um, Thomas's book and, and to the ideas. And of course, um, he brought, he brings to the fore inequality and identifies it as the problem that economists should be concerned about. And he spends the whole introduction really making the argument that inequality was something that economists used to be concerned about, what economists would call distribution, that sort of faded from favor. And um, in the work that he's done over the years with um, uh, Anthony Atkinson and Emmanuel Saez and many other scholars, they've documented this massive rise in inequality globally and of course set out to understand what that means for the economy. We, the editors, by the time we finished and put this volume to bed, believe that the 2016 election here in the United States and some of the other global political trends make this work actually um, more important than ever. 
and in fact concluded in our introduction, which we put together after the election, that we thought that, that at least the outcome here in the US um, makes Piketty's core assertion that if we don't address inequality, it will have these negative outcomes on politics and policy. We felt that it makes it even stronger and it's one of the reasons I'm so excited that we're having this conversation here this evening. Hopefully we can get to some of those issues. Um, we also really hope that this will spark some engagement and, and critique of Piketty, but that will move the conversation forward. So in the introduction, we laid out four big questions that we had for capital in the 21st century. And they are, um, is the argument that Thomas Piketty has right that he lays out in, the, in Capital in the 21st Century? Should we care about his conclusions and, and what, he, uh, what he uncovered? What are the implications if he's right, even if he's wrong? And what ought we to do next? And so these are the, some of the questions that I hope we can um, uh, attack here in our conversation this evening. So let me turn to our panel. And I want to start, um, I want to start with you, Bronco, on the end. Um, uh, you know, so Thomas's book came out a couple years ago. Um, there's been other things that people have been talking about and thinking about. You know, Janet kind of opened up a little bit with um, what his book was about. But can you tell me, um, and we'll kind of go through all three of you, just quickly, you know, what do you think the key takeaways that you want to refresh the audience's memory about if they haven't been studying it in anticipation of this very exciting event this evening? Um, well, thank you very much. I, uh, it's, it's difficult, of course, to, to summarize a book which has like 980 pages or whatever. Uh, and as we know from John, it is used even by eye doctors to, you know, check the site. Maybe R greater than G could be a good a sort of way to you know, check your eyes out. Uh, I, actually, for me, I think the first one, I would say three things, actually. The first one is bringing back the importance of capital, which uh, somehow has faded also, not only in distribution, I mean, uh, not only has income distribution faded as a topic, but also the role of capital in the topic. And I was reminded of that recently when I went to the uh, a library here, and actually it was interesting, it was placed next to Marx Capital. So it was, you know, uh, interesting fact that maybe the title led people to put it in the same place, although uh, Piketty says he's not a Marxist. Uh, so that's one point, bringing back capital is an important thing which determines single distribution. The second one, I think, is uh, what was mentioned before, the scope and his open uh, sort of, um, how should I say, introduction of history, other social sciences, which makes the book actually really fun to read, and it makes it very different from the books that we have been used to recently, because there was a kind of a division, either you have a very technical... Mic is off. Oh, mic is off, yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. Should I repeat yeah. everything now, <laughs> from the beginning? <laughs> Uh, so the second point was actually that he brought, you know, social sciences, history, uh, and uh, even literature, of course, and makes the book much more fun and more pleasant to read. And it is really in the um, sort of in the vein of really big books in economics that were actually very social science based. And it's not surprising, as as Heather said, that of course he liked people, sociologists, historians, geographers, to contribute to the volume. And I think the third one may be sort of slightly more economical, in terms of economics, maybe more important, is what I actually see an attempt to combine, uh, you know, theory of production, theory of distribution, factorial income distribution, that is, between capital and labor, and theory of interpersonal income distribution. Although they are technically combined, they were often studied separately one from the other. And actually in the book, actually the three of them are really sort of combined. And in that sense, it's a, it's a grand, uh, well, grand synthesis or grand theory that actually is offered to us in the book. Paul? Can I, I just want to say, I, I agree with everything Bronco just said. And I think, um, I think kind of, it might be important to think of there being three kinds of readers of the, of the book and of the original Piketty book. And, it, and it, and one of the great things is that it reached all three. And one group are the people who were really not fully aware of just how much the concentration of income and wealth at the top has exploded. You know, everybody on this stage, everybody associated, probably almost everybody in this audience was well aware of that, but lots of people weren't. 
It still wasn't out there. And even though some of us have been citing Atkinson and Piketty and Saez for, for many years, it, this, this was the book that really brought that to a mass audience. And that, is, that in itself, however he, whatever the magic was uh, that made it happen, that's, that's very important. Um, the second, which was, I think, news to many of us, even those of us who work in this area, was it, it, it was in effect telling us that the, that the nature of this uh, concentration of, of income and wealth at the top is changing. That we still have, in a way, an 80s frame of mind that we visualize uh, that, that, that it's individuals who one way or another have made fortunes, that self-made men, that it's whether, you know, it, it's either Steve Jobs or Gordon Gecko, depending upon what your, your take on, on the goodness or badness of what's going on uh, in our society is. And while that is still true to some extent, uh, that uh, uh, Piketty is drawing our attention to the notion that increasingly now we're now, we are looking at patrimonial capitalism, inherited fortunes. Think, don't think Steve Jobs, think Koch brothers. And that's, uh, and, and he makes an argument that that's increasingly going to be the case. Um, and the, the historical part, actually one thing that for an American, it was very important that he says, you know, don't think gilded age, which is America, which is an era of self-made men, think more belle epoque, late 19th century France, which is very much a, a dynastic inherited wealth thing. And then the third thing is there is this remarkable, um, fascinating, but you know, insider technical integration of the theory of economic growth, the theory of factorial distribution of income between capital and labor, and the theory of the individual distribution of income and wealth, which he tries to integrate together. And that's the part where I think there are you know, the most criticisms, the things you can raise, but it, it's, it, it's, it's a magnificent effort regardless, and it's one of the things that led those of us who would have loved it anyway to say, oh my God, I can't believe he actually managed to do that too. Yeah, <laughs> so I absolutely agree with what Paul and Branco just said. Uh, popularization of uh, inequality studies and analysis and assessment of trends and uh, bringing in into the discussion the role of inheritance and patrimonial capitalism. But at the same time, one of the main, uh, I, I believe, contribution of the book is also to popularize the role of history in understanding the economic trends, both at the aggregate level, but also to understand the distributional consequences of that trends for our economies. Um, history is always, uh, is usually overlooked in economics and um, it comes very strongly out of uh, Thomas Piketty's book and, and the analysis of what happens to uh, taxation over, over, over the history, over the, over the century is quite powerful to look in relationship to distributional outcomes. And also it unveils the fact that uh, things that were quite radical were actually implemented in not far distant past. And that's, uh, that's I think, one of also of the uh, main contribution of, of Thomas Piketty's book. The other one is building on uh, Branco's comment on bringing in the capital, uh, um, uh, sort of the analysis on the capital income, but also on the capital uh, in the aggregate uh, production function, if you, if you wish. But I would look at that capital uh, more from the household or individual point of view, is rather the asset side of the, of the balance sheets of the individuals in the households that is very important for living standard and living conditions of individuals because wealth um, is, is one of the most powerful uh, uh, means to, uh, um, to, um, uh, to bring forward to, in dynastic terms, uh, economic advantages to our children. That's you know the role of inheritance that, that Paul uh, highlighted before. So the the wealth as a role of uh, uh, of uh, consumption enhancing tool for the present and the future, but wealth also as a as a means of uh, as a mean of control over people's life. And I'm thinking about the role. Uh, and you know uh, the role of employers employee relationship or the or the role of um, uh, of uh, extremely uh, rich uh, and wealthy individuals um, so yeah wealth inheritance and history yeah it's i'm glad you brought up history um, a number of the essays in here um, 
uh, are critiques from uh, people outside of economics or thinking sort of outside of the neoclassical model for um, both praising Piketty for bringing in history and, and questioning institutions, but then also trying to unpack that and sort of saying, you know, and Suresh Naidu, if he was here, also talked a lot about that in his chapter, um, where, you know, th th still Piketty has a bit of that black box when it comes to actually how institutions work. And um, I argued in my chapter and some of the, uh, uh, how history plays out uh, for different groups. But I'm glad you brought that into the conversation. Um, and this sort of leads into my next question, which is about critiques. Um, so, uh, you know, what, what do you think, and I think, Paul, you, you talked a little bit about this, um, in yours around the the, the, func the distribution between capital and labor that there needs to be more work there. So I'll start with you, um, and you can go off on that more other things. Like, So do we know yet, a few years out, whether or not the book is right? And um, do we have places where we think that he didn't get the economics right, or where we, where we still have big questions that we want, that we think people need to address? Okay, um, so no, we clearly, are, the, the, the big thesis is going to take us a generation to, to find out whether, whether the big thesis about the transformation is right. I mean, I, there's enough in there to say, look, he certainly caught on to something that w wasn't there before. You can just take a look at your, um, you know, your, your Forbes 400 or whatever and, and, and see that, that there are a, a surprising number of people who are who, who, who inherited their wealth and also a surprising number of people who are 80 years old, which means there's going to be a lot more people who inherited their wealth in that group uh, as we go forward a bit. Um, so that in itself is revelatory, but whether we really are going to be seeing a shift increasingly towards patrimonial capitalism um, in the next 20 years, we don't know yet. Um, there are, um, and it, it, it remains true that to date, most of the explosion of income concentration at the very top has not been about capital. It has been about compensation of some form. It has been about bonuses and, and executive pay. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of interesting discussion in, um, in, in capital in the 21st century about that, but, but not nearly the level of rigor of explanation because it's hard when nobody really fully understands it. And I, you know, I think he, his, his discussion is, is good on that. There is a little bit of, uh, the place where I think there's the closest to him being wrong is not quite, right the, quite the right word, but where I think there's a really serious critique from the economist's point of view. And I can, you know, uh, the historical and social issues, uh, I'll defer to, uh, to other people, um, but the, um, he makes a lot about the rising ratio of capital to income, that we're, we've been accumulating capital in a way you know, that we basically had a, uh, a lot of capital was destroyed by the, by the wars of the 20th century and then we restore it and we get a much more capital. And he talks about this as a story of there's more and more um, capital out there and that this given certain parameters, whatever, tends to raise the capital share of income even as it reduces the, the, um, uh, the rate of return. Um, and the, the thing about that has become clear is that an awful lot of that rise in the value of capital is real estate. So it, um, a lot of the Piketty book is written as if there, there's, there's capital and there's labor, which is true, but an awful lot of the capital by value turns out to be housing. And that's a, um, that just changed your picture, I think, significantly. It doesn't mean that the, the underlying thesis is wrong, but it means that, that it's, a, it's a little harder to make his case than might otherwise have seemed to be the case. Well, let me ask you just, um, well, let me, I'll, I'll, let me go on to, Salvador, do you want to take next, you know, what you think are some of the major criticisms and, and issues where we, you still see big questions? Yeah, from, from the economic point of view, um, I agree with Paul, the, the, the issue of capital and wealth is a, is a problematic one, also from the, the determinant of what uh, gave rise to a, an increasing capital income ratio or an increasing wealth inequality. And whether most of the wealth inequality comes from real estate is 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 somewhat different than uh, coming from uh, an increasing concentration of ownership of firms or stock ownership, um, and therefore the question is, 
uh, we are moving uh, from a classic, if you wish, uh, patrimonial capitalism to a middle class patrimonial capitalism, which, which is to some extent from the policy point of view is harder to address. There is much more resistance, I believe, uh, in, for instance, well, real estate wealth taxation, for instance, in the sense that it, to the extent where real estate and um, a, a strong increase in, uh, in wealth uh, e evaluation of real estate is actually impairing uh, uh, growth and equitable distribution of uh, access to opportunities and wealth. I'm sorry, I just can't resist, but you know, we can easily envisage a sort of Belle Epoque thing where in, inherited uh, capitalists with vast industrial empires end up dominating the political process. But to imagine that you know, modern economies could be dominated by real estate tycoons is inconceivable. Uh, Even... <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. I, I don't know whether I said that, but yeah, I agree. <laughs> If I said that, maybe I should revise my English teacher. <laughs> Couldn't help myself there. Um, no, and, and the, uh, yeah. Um, have you, yeah. No, that was, that was. Um, so the, the other, the other uh, potential um, um, worry from my point of view is, um, is that I think we shouldn't make uh, the mistake of, um, Considering the book and is and Thomas Piketty's analysis an overarching theory of everything, um, I think there are limits to a theory, and then we should acknowledge that. And also, there is an enormous difference across country. We always have in mind the U.S. as an experience for what happened to income and wealth distribution. But actually, if you look at the data, uh, experience in income and wealth distribution do vary a lot across countries. So I think that's probably um, something that is missing in the book, trying to understand why experiences are different across countries and what different institutions, wh which role do, do different, uh, different institutions play in that? And actually, just to say, it's spect rather spectacularly, top, top income shares, which is what, what so much of this research is about. Uh, um, the, the big contrast we often make is between the United States, which is where the top income share has uh, skyrocketed, and France, France, where it has not. So it's kind of interesting that, that uh, Thomas should have written this book. Yeah, definitely. Well, and it's, it's also interesting because as you, I mean, in some ways, some of your criticisms are about things that we, we you know, he's writing a book that's making an argument about what's going to happen far off into the future. And so he's arguing if this trends continue, then we, then there is going to be this convergence, but you don't know it yet. And there is this question because you have these differing experiences across countries, which I think also again comes back to understanding the institutional differences um, and doing that, that heavy lifting. Bronco, do you want to weigh in on this question? Well, I, <clears throat> let me actually, I want to make maybe two points. I'm not sure how, strictly related there to the question, but in some <laughs> sense, they all are related. A uh, first point is actually the, the, uh, the usage of, of the term now of patrimonial capitalism. And I'm very pleased that we are all using it very freely. I have to tell you the anecdote originally, because I read the book in French, and actually in French it does make sense, much more, I think, than in English. And when I wrote the review, I actually didn't know how to write it. So I, I actually, my original review was inheritance-based capitalism, mm -hmm. which actually the book is about that. And then I actually talked to Thomas and to, to uh, I think to Arthur uh, Goldhammer, who was the translator, and I said, how should we translate that? And they said, no, no, we'll go with patrimonial capitalism because it will become a technical term. So I think actually to some extent it has become a technical term. I think originally it seems to me, although I'm not a native English speaker, but it didn't seem to me that to convey the, the image that it does in other languages, but I think now that it does, actually it has become a sort of a, 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 almost a technical term. But um, it really emphasizes the, the inheritance role. So can I interrupt you just for a second, because yeah. this is what my chapter is on. Um, uh, the, that I, I read it and I took I mean, I was not actually going to talk about my chapter, but thank you, Bronco. Um, I took issue, I mean, the whole time reading it, it was so shocking every time I read the word um, patrimonial capitalism, and he never once unpacked 
the fact that in the English language, I do not speak French, so so what do I know of like what you know what the original language it is? But in in English, that means inheritance through the father. That is the dictionary definition of patrimonial capitalism. So it's not. Whereas I understand from art that in the French usage, it means national inheritance. So it has this bigger meaning. It's a meaning. It's more inclusive. It isn't so gendered. And he also has all of these wonderful, evocative stories from Jane Austen and these other authors writing about um, what this, what inequality looked like in different eras when, of course, inheritance was by law in many countries through the male line. So, um, but he never unpacked that and um, uh, uh, never sort of explored what that actually means for gender equity. Um, but I'll let you, that's, you know, go on with your criticisms. And uh, well, I will not actually go with the criticism because I think actually I agree that uh, this, uh, how should I say, not a confusion, but the use of the capital and wealth was, was criticized, of course, because for non-economists, just to mention, for, uh, for economists, K as capital is productive capital and comes into production function and, you know, theory of growth and so on. But wealth, for people who work on income distribution like myself, includes all other things, including real estate and other things which are even not necessarily immediately marketable, although obviously real estate is. Uh, so there is a little bit of a difference between the, the two, between the two, and in the book that's not actually uh, clear. Uh, the two are really conflated. Uh, but I want to say one last thing is about the part of the book which I think has not received the attention that I think deserves is towards, towards the end, because maybe n not too many people got to the end. Uh, <laughs> but, it's long. <laughs> it's long. Uh, but there was, uh, towards the end, actually, there is an analysis based on the French data only, because that's the, the only country which apparently has the data like that, which shows what percentage of people would inherit uh, amount of money which would allow them, given expected life, ex uh, given life expectancy, to, to with that money to live on a sort of um, uh, uh, sort of medium or, uh, or median level of income of that country, which is actually a very impressive statistic because when you sort of think of that, if I inherit something, that would actually allow me to live at the mean income level of my country until I die. So in that sense, it is really a very strong sort of, um, it brings back the role of inheritance very strongly. And I think at that part of the book, there is something which I even like to call, he has actually three, you know, a fundamental, actually two fundamental laws and one fundamental inequality. I actually believe there is a fourth one, which is basically that one. Well, a number of the chapters um, also deal with the human capital component of this and talk a little bit about the inheritance aspects, what elites are leaving to their children in terms of better access to college and and um, human capital, which we're not gonna probably talk about too much on this panel, but I think it's worth at least noting um, that piece of the inheritance as well that he, he, he uh, uh, doesn't think is an important part of the story. Um, I wanna sort of keep on this, this topic here, and I actually wanna turn to you, Paul. Um, you know, one of, the, one of the issues with the, the return to the so-called patrimonial capitalism is, um, is that, it, it imp that today, it is still the case that most people are getting most of their income at the top from labor income, not capital income. And so he shows that you know it was during the Belle Epoque and the Gilded Age that that the very top point, you know, one percent were all getting their most of their income from capital. Today they they continue to get it from labor until the very very tippy top. Um, and so one set of questions is is that a measurement issue? Is it that um, you know, it, we know that executive income, high incomes can be, you know, categorically flexible. Some of it could really be um, capital, could be thought of as capital income or la labor income. But what is the, what's the issue there? Um, okay, I don't think it's actually, I don't think it's a problem of us mislabeling um, what is truly capital income. Uh, if you look at what a, hedge fund manager or a, a Fortune 500 CEO receives, he, and it's almost always he, uh, is not, that's not because of the, the, the inherited wealth that, that he brought to the table. That is associated with the job, whether it's you know, earned in a social sense is a, is a whole different question. But it's, I, so it's, I don't think it's now. Now what is true is that, that the, 
the way that income comes for such people is very different from the way it comes from an ordinary wage or salary worker. It's not that there's a job and there's pay. It's you do something and you either, if it, it, you, you climb a, you know, you, it comes in the form of stock options, although those are actually a lot less tied in reality to the price of the stock than people think because the, the basis tends to get adjusted. But it, in the finance industry, it comes from however much uh, profit you've managed to make. Um, that's what's odd is that argument is used um, sometimes to, to defend the preferential tax treatment. I mean, we have the carried interest loophole, which lets um, people who, you know, in, in the finance industry who have uh, uh, pay a much lower tax rate, and the argument is, well, yes, they're working hard and all this stuff, but the returns to that labor are highly uncertain, and so you want, wouldn't want to treat it as normal income, to which some of us can say, you know, um, writing a book uh, is you put in an awful, an awful lot of work and then you have no idea how much, if any, money you're going to make at the end and somehow or other uh, I'm paying a full... Uh, anyway, um, the... Um, but I don't think it's, I don't think it's a kind of... It, there, there, what, there's something going on. I mean, I, to a large extent, this is a category of income that was... It must have always existed. I mean, John D. Rockefeller, the original John D. Rockefeller, did not inherit his wealth. Um, for most of his life, presumably, was making most of his money through the profits of the enterprises rather than as return on his accumulated capital. But it seems to be much more prevalent now than it was before, uh, which is a bit of a problem for the Piketty argument because he's saying, well, inherited wealth will, will go back to becoming much more central. But I don't think it's a fundamental category error. Okay. Um, would either of you like to comment on that? Yeah. I also only only have a small technical comment on the, not technical but related to the data. Um, it is true that um, the original Piketty and size studies on top income in the U.S. was showing that, uh, relatively speaking, labor income was much much more prevalent at the top. If we exclude the top zero zero one percent, of course. Um, but it's also true that, for instance, once you, and that study in particular was based on tax statistics, so on tax returns. And the problem is that not all, the cap, not all capital income is reported in the tax returns, and in, most importantly, a growing share of capital income is not reported in tax returns, which means that this led um, to my Piketty, Emmanuel Saez, and Gra Gabriel Zuckman to do a follow-up study uh, which is now part of the DINA project, DINA project, Distributional Income National Account. So what they did is like they, they took the national account income and they distributed back to the population. So that does not suffer from the tax uh, reported bias. And actually when you do that, it's actually surprising to see how capital income rises across the distribution. So even at the bottom of the distribution, you have a lot of capital income. Uh, and this is due usually f uh, to the fact that most of capital, for instance, from tax exempt savings account was not reported in tax statistics. And when you go at the top, even top 10% is actually now earning much more income from cap capital and not from labor. Then, you know, the research question is still open, but uh, I wanted to uh, point out that. Yeah, let me just say, actually, yes, returns, profits, uh, dividends, uh, capital gains, which are popping up in your uh, account in the Bahamas, is not going to be in the original uh, piggity <laughs> size data and may mean that we actually are more like the 19th century than we think we are. Yes, um, and, that's, uh, and there's been a lot of new interesting research um, on that question uh, recently. And that actually is a nice segue to a, a question I have for you, Bronco, that I wanted to ask you, if I can get my papers there. Um, so, you know, uh, thinking about, um, uh, well, I think of the Bahamas and I think of taxes. So this is where this question is going, um, or tax avoidance. Um, so, Bronco, in your chapter, you lay out a model that teases out the effects of a rising capital income share on income inequality in different types of economies. And you conclude that if a rising capital income share is a problem, the solution is less concentration the solution is less concentration in the ownership of capital. So you call, you call for opening up the, um, the ownership which, um, of capital as a solution, which contrasts which, with Piketty's key conclusion, which is that we need to tax capital. Could you talk to, about that for a moment? Uh, 
Yes, well, thank you for, for that. Actually, uh, what I want to, to explain is that if we take uh, not only Piketty's work, but actually even empirical data, what we notice is that if you look, for example, at Credit Suisse report, which is published annually about you know, wealth in the world, uh, what you notice is that richer countries are not only richer, like you take, like, for example, Switzerland and India, and the ratio in their incomes is like uh, eight to one. But the ratio in wealth per person or per adult is not eight to one, it's like 15 to one. In other words, rich countries are not simply, uh, uh, in terms of wealth, richer in, uh, than poor countries proportionately to how much better off they are in terms of GDP. So in reality, they become richer also in terms of wealth. So if you take that view and uh, like look at empirically, and that was of course Piketty's argument that as countries become more mature and richer, the wealth will become larger and larger compared to their income or GDP. Then whatever, unless the return to that wealth becomes, uh, goes down proportionately to the way that the wealth goes up, you would have larger share of net income being received out of capital. And I think it's actually just a purely arithmetic thing. If, if capital sort of gets, you know, if there is more capital and the return on that capital doesn't fall proportionately, you simply have more return, more income received from capital. And that goes back to this patrimonial capitalism and so on. Now then the question becomes, if we really don't do anything about that, you would be essentially automatically translating that increase in the capital share in greater inequality in interpersonal income distribution simply because capital is very heavily concentrated. And again, that's something that we know empirically, that concentration of capital is much greater, obviously, than concentration of income or consumption or anything else. So then you essentially have really a direct transmission from higher capital share into higher inequality among us as individuals. And then my argument was then we should then think of the ways of deconcentrating. This is really sort of a bad word, but I cannot come up with a better one. <laughs> uh, uh, because when I say equalizing, uh, capital ownership, it seems that actually I would like everybody to have the same ownership. That's kind of an extreme. So deconcentration simply means having less of a concentration than we have currently. So that's the idea that is behind that. It is not in, in contrast, in contradiction with Piketty's idea, but it is uh, to some extent I think it's complementary because if you look at his point, is that that idea of taxing capital is precisely the result of his view that the capital share will become more and more important and the way to stop the transmission into higher inequality is to tax capital. And to tax, uh, in, in other words, to tax wealth, which of course is much more difficult if you have so much wealth hidden in, uh, abroad. So, so let me, if I can just uh, summarize, one way is actually you just tax wealth, and the other way you make wealth more broadly shared. So there are really these two different approaches. Thank you. Um, so let me uh, go to a question for Salvatore. Um, so uh, I, I liked all of the chapters equally, but I also very much liked your chapter um, uh, because... Uh, Thank you. <laughs> Some are more equal than others. <laughs> Um, at, the, at, at Equitable Growth, um, we've been thinking a lot about the intersection between inequality and economic growth and stability, and that is the core of your chapter, where you talk about um, the effects of inequality on destabilizing economies and, and the intersection between that and the business cycle. And uh, could you just um, give talk for a couple of minutes about um, what you've discovered in that chapter and, and just give us the, the key highlights? Yeah. So yeah, the title of the chapter is Rising Inequality and Economic Stability. And the, the, the chap chapter's main objective is to, as you said, to dig deeper, deeper in the, into the very important issue and also a very old question about the um, interrelationship, the nexus between rising inequality and economic growth, performance, and uh, stability. And this provides us with um, with uh, an interesting and instrumental reason to focus on uh, uh, on economic inequality that goes beyond um, that goes beyond equity uh, equity reasons um, and yeah fairness reason and the chapter essentially is a critical assessment of the literature and uh, the empirical and theoretical literature concerning these questions, but also goes a little bit beyond the classic interpretation and the classic uh, dissection of the 
of the, of the argument as inequalities leading to higher or lower economic growth. I, um, I tend, I, I, what I tried, to, attempted to do is to dig deeper into the heterogeneity of what we means by inequality and what we means by economic growth and performance. And so why is this related to Piketty's um, uh, book? Uh, well, Piketty's main uh, argument and contribution was to highlight uh, the macroeconomic, um, uh, how the macroeconomic uh, uh, circumstances may affect uh, the uh, wealth distribution within the economy. So how uh, the aggregate rate of uh, capital returns versus the aggregate rate of economic growth might affect the way wealth distribution uh, uh, changes over time, so it's the R greater than G type of argument. And what, um, what th instead, the chapter and, and the book by Thomas Piketty was, was rather more silent about what is the reverse order of causality. So how uh, inequality may affect in turn macroeconomic circumstances. So in a way, the, the ambition uh, or the objective of the chapter was to answer can we endogenize, in technical terms, economic growth or performance into Piketty's model? Um, so the assertion that inequality has led or to a destabilization of the economy has typ typically fallen into uh, two main lines uh, of argument. One uh, is related to how inequality may affect economic growth, so GDP growth. Um, um, income growth and performance more generally, so volatility, etc. And the other one, how inequality may affect financial instability. And the two things, of course, may be a, um, a forced uh, um, sort of conceptualization, but they do have different features. Um, so, um, of course, the investigation of uh, inequality growth nexus is a long tradition in economics. And most, mostly the literature is focused on, on the economic growth bit, so uh, GDP growth. What I try to do is starting from a different angle of observation, which is let's analyze the complexity of economic growth. So economic growth is not just GDP growth, but it could be volatility of growth. So how volatile is that growth over time? whether or not once an economy is hit by a recession, is that recession, the magnitude of the recession and the time that the economy takes in order to recover, so the resilience of the economy, is that affected by the level of inequality um, or not? Uh, also, is once, once a, a, a country uh, starts a process of economic growth, is that process um, more stable and sustainable once we observe the initial level of inequality or not? And these are also uh, questions that recent literature has explored, and, uh, and that's why uh, the debate has been enrich enriched by these uh, different new questions. For instance, um, let's start uh, from the idea that uh, inequality is leading to volatile aggregate performance, so more volatility in the economy. This is uh, an idea that in theory was also present back in 1930 with the famous account of the great crash by, uh, by uh, Galbraith. And he, in his book, one of, the, uh, one of the determinants of potential instability in the economy that led then to the crash uh, was uh, potential, he, uh, in, his, in, in a passage in his book, he, he, he highlights the role of income inequality, especially at the top, and how economy the economy, in that case the US economy, was particularly um, affected by the volatility of investment and luxury consumption that was concentrated at the top. And this argument was resonated, for example, in recent analysis by uh, Bob Frank, uh, Rob Frank, uh, who summarizes the problem very well with a, um, with a quotation where he says, America's dependence on the rich, which is the increase in top income shares, for instance, plus the greater volatility among the rich equals a more volatile America. So a greater share of the pie, more volatile share of the pie equals uh, an aggregate income, which is more volatile. A recent IMF study has also uh, estimated that more than 70% of US changes in consumption between 2003 and 2013 derived from uh, top 10% behavior, like the income within the top percent. Um, 
another, uh, actually Piketty himself had a, had a, had a theory with, together with Banerjee and Aguillon in, 90, in late 90s where they endogenized the business cycle and they linked that to wealth inequality, especially between investors and savers. But yeah, you want to jump in? No, no, okay. Well, um, let me, can I jump in and, and, and as I want to actually tee a question off exactly what you just said, um, and I, but I also want to give the audience one um, little heads up, which is that in about four minutes, I'm going to turn to questions from you all. So if you could be thinking now, um, there's microphones. So if you want to get up and get in line, um, you feel free to do that. But, uh, but actually, probably better to just stay seated because it'll be really obnoxious to stand up and walk through the crowd. So I'll call on people. But... Um, just get, get ready for that. But let me tee off exactly what we were talking about, the, about the consumption patterns at the top and that leading to volatility. Because, I mean, that has been a conversation that we've had a lot, especially since the financial crisis and um, especially as we were thinking about how we pull out of it. And um, somewhat related to that, I actually wanted to, I'm trying to segue here into politics just a little bit, just before we, before we go to opening the questions. You know, one thing that you wrote about, Paul, is that you know, sometimes you wrote, quote, in your piece, that sometimes it seems as if a substantial part of our political class is actively working to restore Piketty's patrimonial capitalism, end quote. And you also reference the French Third Republic, which Piketty brings up in, in Capital in the 21st Century, which is founded on very egalitarian notions, yet still managed to be an extremely unequal society. Most of the wealth was still controlled by a small sliver of society. So... If we have this challenge with this higher inequality, um, and it, you know, and, um, uh, with folks at the top, what what do we need? What you know, and not just for the United States, but for other countries, that would be an effective counteractive force to this entrenchment of wealth and entrenchment of political power. Okay, um, so three quick points. First, uh, one of the, the the one piece that really impressed me with Piketty. It was the discussion of the Third French Republic, which is libertarian, egalitarian, fraternité, and yet uh, politics is dominated by vast inherited wealth dynasties. And, and a, a point he makes is that the intellectual domination, that, that the fact that, the, that, that inherited wealth in effect managed to set the terms of discussion, managed to define what was responsible, what you could do. And, and you, know, you can easily see how, looking at a lot of things that are going on in America now, how that happens. We can talk about you know, foundations, we can talk about influence, we can talk about all of those things. Um, then there's, but there's a countervailing thing, which is also stuff I should have known, but where he talks about the United States and the progressive era in the United States when remarkably, which was also vastly unequal society, but in which it was quite common for people, often people who were themselves um, very much on the top class, to express ideas that would be regarded as radically left-wing today, right? It was perfectly common to talk about the dangers of a vast wealth, to talk about the importance of high inheritance taxes to prevent concentration, and you would even have people, I believe, including Theodore Roosevelt, saying things like, uh, we would want to tax this wealth even aside from the revenue. We want, we want to make sure that these great fortunes do not accumulate. And anyone who tried to say that now would be you know, accused of being a, a radical Marxist, which suggests that maybe the dominance of patrimonial wealth is not, the intellectual dominance is not as large as we might imagine. But the last thing to say is countervailing institutions. You want to ask what else can serve, and it's very difficult. Maybe my imagination is limited, but it's hard for me to think of anything that I know in my history that is comparable to the historical but now largely vanished role, at least in this country, of unions. Organized labor has always been the huge counterweight to, uh, to organized wealth, and, uh, and that diminution, you know, if, if, if you ask me what would be the one thing that I could... Would, would want to see happen to get us back to you know, what we used to be. It would be somehow or other to restore the role of a substantial, effective labor movement. Um, three cheers to that. So um, are there any questions out there? Yes, so people do need to go to the mics. Rick, go ahead. Right, good for picking an aisle seat there. 
Hi, uh, Rick McGahey with the Institute for New Economic Thinking. This is really kind of an economics question. Uh, there's been recent uh, literature and discussion in economics with a, a different framing of inequality, and I'm thinking of the work on superstar firms or in, intra-industry firm, the kind of stuff that David Autor, Larry Katz, and other people have been doing that seem to focus on in a, a driver of inequality and a declining labor share overall as being re rooted more in uh, call them oligopoly firms, but large firms really that are controlling data, controlling production. I just am curious, and maybe this is a future research agenda, how do you think about those explanations for inequality in reference to kind of a Piketty driven more kind of ownership and build up in generational patrimonial capitalism? Just to, um, um, there, there's something, there, there are a couple of things, I, 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 Quick answer. Um, the the arguments that say that inequality is largely about inequality between firms. Um, even I, um, it's interesting research. At some level, I'm not convinced, but that's that's technical discussion that we need here. Um, the uh, the role of monopoly power, of increased market power, uh, does look increasingly significant. Something something is causing the the capital. Capital. The, the, the share of labor income in national income is declining, and one plausible explanation is, in fact, growing monopoly power. So that the decline of antitrust enforcement may be other forces. Uh, and there's kind of question that, you know, is it, when we see capital share rising, is it because of the, the robots, is it technology, or is it because of market power? And for, there are a lot of reasons to think that market power has to be a large part of the story. Well, and um, I'll note that one of the chapters in the book is by David Wheel, who um, just stepped down a couple of months ago from leading the Wage and Hour Division in the Department of Labor, is back at Boston University, and he wrote a book um, called The Fissured Workplace, and his chapter applies um, his line of thinking, which is, I think, a, a bit, it's not orthogonal to what you said, Paul, but, a, a, but related, but, but, but unrelated, where he argues that um, that, that you're seeing this discrepancy across firms, where some firms are um, uh, outsourcing more and more of what they used to do in-house, which is creating firms sort of lower down the supply chain that, can't, that, can't, that don't have the capacity to tap into the value that's created by this, by the main firm, often which is focused on um, brand management, not actually sort of making anything. So he talks about this as a fissuring um, across co corporations, but also as a way to explain that the increasing fact that inequality across people, across workers, is, is, uh, is inner firm inequality. Um, so just it, an interesting contribution to that debate. Yeah, just to make that a little concrete, if, if your corporation used to have uh, uh, if, if the cafeteria workers were company employees on the company benefits plan and everything else, and now they are contract employees at some fl firm paying minimum wage, that's going to show up as an increase in personal income inequality, and it's going to show up as an increase in inter-firm inequality, but it isn't really exactly in the sense that we know what you might think it was. Yeah. Um, let's go to the next question over here. And just if you could um, briefly state uh, your name and then go quickly to your question. Sure. Um, I'm Christina Arroyo, and I study industrial and organizational psychology. So I was interested in, um, Professor Krugman, you talked about unions as a counteracting force against rising inequality. And I was wondering, uh, Janet Gornick, who's speaking about uh, how universities and schools increase social mobility and reduce inequality. And I was wondering whether organizations, private businesses, corporations, also have the responsibility to become, in the future, perhaps the great equalizers as schools have become? Um, I, yeah, I, I don't know. But maybe, um, I, I almost hate to use the language of responsibility because not, not out of any personal moral aversion, but because I don't think they care. Um, <laughs> but, uh, um, but the point was that they, they did, in fact, if you go back to the, you know, to the America, I grew up in, um, there were uh, large corporations uh, viewed themselves as, as representing a variety of stakeholders, not simply, not simply the stock investors, and that included labor. And that was partly either because they were unionized or because 
there were enough unions out there that they knew that they would become unionized if they didn't. So there, there is certainly a way in which the private sector can play a role in being an institution for inequality. And that is, in fact, the way America was for about uh, 40 years after World War II. So it's, we know it can happen, whether how we get make that happen now, I don't know, but yeah. Robert Avila, I spent about 40 years as either corporate staff or corporate consultant after getting my degree in economics. The thing that I am aware of is the shift that took place in terms of the attitude of corporate executives towards their job after the marginal income tax disappeared. We had about 60 years or so in the U.S. of the extremely high confiscatory marginal income tax, which in effect put a lid on corporate executive pay. And you can see this by the degree to which it skyrocketed after the tax cuts relative to normal workers. During that period, we had exactly what you had just been talking about, corporate executives who had interests in stakeholders other than stockholders. I was in the office of a major corporation in the early 70s when the executive said, to hell with Wall Street, we're gonna do what we wanna do. We don't have to go there do for any money right now. Can, can, do you have I a wanna question? know to what extent the marginal income tax disappearing has contributed to what we have seen. Thank you, thank you. Um, uh, yeah, um, there's actually, first of all, I, I, I'm pretty sure it's Piketty and Saez, uh, among others, who have made exactly that argument. And Stancheva and other people in the audience, who I can and, see in the audience. And then, uh, on this. yeah, and um, IMF even, I believe, has some recent uh, stuff. I, that, that Exactly, that it, if you like, think about a corporate executive who um, has various interests. I mean, he, he wants to be rich, and uh, he also does wants to not have his employees hate him and doesn't want to, you know, and um, uh, and if there's a 91% marginal tax rate, as there was in the in, in the 50s, um, he's probably going to pay more attention to the, um, the to the non-personal pecuniary aspects of the job. And so part of the explosion of top incomes probably does reflect the fact that we've made it possible for people to keep whatever they get by by making life harder for other people. There is certainly economic empirical evidence to that effect. So I have a question that I want to throw out to the to the panel here. Um, I'll get to you in a sec. Just one second. Let me let me throw this one at. Well, I'll let you ask your question, then I'll ask my question. Mine is quite quick. My name is Tracy Rochick from the United Nations, and my question is: um, We're seeing a lot of articles currently related to real estate and removing the tax benefit for. Um, owning basically real estate, especially sort of in the housing market and it's positioned as a way to de-gentrify the entire process. Given the fact that this uh, book is looking at the economic implications in other realms, I'm wondering, I'm very skeptical of these articles currently, and I'm wondering if there's other political implications, social implications, zoning, et cetera, that you can maybe think of beyond the economic arguments that are being positioned on this. Thanks. I think we need another conference for this one. It's, just, <laughs> it's a huge issue. It's a very important one, but it's a huge one. It is. I mean, I, I will just say, because I think, I think um, it is a big question. One thing I'll note on it, I mean, we already have talked here this evening that a lot of the capital um, that Piketty measures and his colleagues is about real estate. Um, and he calls for taxing capital, which, you know, what we have in the United States where we do tax capital because we tax real estate, but we also give this massive bonus if you borrow money to purchase that real estate, so it is very complicated because um, these things work in opposite directions. Anyone want to take that on or or I can go to my question. Branko, you look like you you might. I'm going to go to my question and then you can take that one too. Okay, you, you get something that I can tell you're going there. So I wanted to end on this question of politics. Um, we're living in this, you know, uh, uh, as, as my notes say, there's a lot of elections going on right now. Um, <laughs> so there's an election that, of course, just happened in France. We had an election in um, the fall here in the United States. There's elections coming up in the United Kingdom. And, um, you know, across a lot of the, the recent um, elections in the United States and Europe, you're seeing this conversation around 
um, uh, this demise of, in some cases, although not all, center-left parties and a rise in leftist and far-right parties. Of course, that's not what happened in France, but certainly what happened here in the United States and in the UK. And there's other countries where um, this appears to be happening as well. So I wanted to end on this, on this note, and I want to go through each of you. I'll start with Bronco. Just, um, do you think that Piketty's political economic analysis has anything to say about the current moment, either here in the United States or in a, another country, pick your country, whichever one you want to talk about, and do you think that his case is strengthened or weakened in terms of current events? And I talked about in my opening that we as the editors, as we were putting together our introduction, felt that the case was strengthened by the U.S. elections, but I'd be very curious to sort of end by your, um, your analysis of, uh, of, of what you all think. Well, this, this question took me a little bit by surprise, so I am really trying to improvise. So let me maybe make two points. The first point, which I think is, uh, falls into the kind of category of the limits of the book, is that the book is very much Western-centric, actually Eurocentric slash United States. So to the extent that that part of the world in terms of output and in terms of population is not increasing, or actually it's decreasing as its share, it is still, of course, the most important part of the world in the sense that it actually sort of uh, influences the other parts of the world more than the other parts of the world influence uh, that part of the world, the West, but actually I think it is the limit of the book. Now, I think actually Piketty is going, and his work now with uh, Saez, with Zuckman and others, is going to kind of go towards sort of inclusion of other card, uh, countries like India, China, and so forth, but this is a, the limit of the book. That it shows also politically, because obviously we are very much concerned about what is happening in Western or rich countries. And there, you know, I must say, actually, I plead the sort of, uh, what is the amendment that you don't have to say? Fifth, Fifth Amendment. <laughs> uh, that I am actually not sure myself if the is case, because he does not, he makes a case about the importance of inequality and how it is important to actually stop further increase in inequality and how it seeps into the political arena. But, so in that sense, yes, actually, he was definitely right. But whether the, the outcomes that we have seen in France or in the US or in the UK reinforce, we would of course say in principle yes, because it, is, it seems that actually his analysis had to do something with the outcomes. But I think actually that the political part of his analysis was not really very well fleshed out to the extent that we can say yes, this really reinforces the case. Salvatore? So I think, I think the book provides a fundamental anchor to what, um, to what we need then to work on in the future. So what, what is uh, mostly lacking from, uh, uh, from the book is um, our faces to the numbers. So what lies behind those numbers? Who are these people? How the wealth was accumulated? How the income was uh, uh, created? So the process that led to rising income and wealth inequality is as fundamental as uh, deriving the right number of the index of inequality. And that's what then provides us with a further understanding of the democratic, of the democracy and the functioning of the democracy within and the society itself, as well as, I think, and fundamentally, try to understand who are um, the key players, who are the, um, the players with which we can create um, we, we, which we can share a common purpose. So who are the, I don't know the right words in English, but yeah. <laughs> no, I, that's, that's important, thank you. Okay, um, I, I am, uh, with, with Bronco, I, I would like to take the fifth to some extent, because I don't, I don't think I understand really what's happening politically. I, I've, I've been paying a fair bit of attention lately to issue polling uh, in this country, um, obviously, and, uh, and the issue polling is interesting because for the most part, as I read it, it says that the general population, the, the, or the voter, you know, likely voters, basically have center-left views, that the, the, this center-left movement that we say is dying is, in fact, on, 
by the issues, almost all of them are issues where people support. People believe in guaranteed health care. People believe in, uh, you know, in, in, uh, in, in most of the in strong social safety net. They want all of these things. Um, uh, the, uh, you can see this, at the most recent polling obviously has been, the United States has been on two things. It's been on health care where people just absolutely hate, you know, what's being proposed. Uh, they, they've, they've suddenly discovered that they love Obamacare uh, now that it's maybe about on its way out. Um, but what was interesting, and this is maybe a kind of last word, the, the poll that came out, I think, this morning, um, Quinnipiac, which showed people very center-left views on almost everything, the one piece of the current administration tax agenda that people do approve of is abolition of the estate tax. So it turns out that people want a strong welfare state, a strong middle class, and patrimonial capitalism. Go figure. Go figure. Some oh, I, I just remember the English word. <laughs> <laughs> Which is? Alliance. We need to ah, find, yes. we need to build alliance with, uh, with entrepreneurs uh, that care about inclusive societies. Yes, and, and hopefully alliances that can help explain the importance of taxing wealth. Well, let's end there. Thank you all so much. And thank you again to Janet and the Stone Center um, for helping us do this. <laughs>